So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good afternoon, Professor Muhammad Yunus. Um, it is an honor to have you here with us today. But we, before we start the session, I would just like to invite Professor Beverly, the Vice President of Education for Monash University, Malaysia, to welcome you formally. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Priya. And it is an absolute delight, Professor Muhammad, to see you even virtually. I've longed for the day when I might meet you in person. So it is my great pleasure and it is a huge privilege that on behalf of Monash University, Malaysia, to introduce you as our guest today. I know our students in this session for the capstone unit ethics and sustainability in a business environment are as excited as I am about having you with us today, Professor Yunus. A social entrepreneur, a banker, and an economist who has spent his life translating vision into practical action for the benefits of millions of people in need across societies around the world. I'm sure we all know that notably Professor Yunus founded the Grameen Bank and pioneered the life of the life-changing concepts of microcredit and microfinance, demonstrating his role as a civil society leader. This work around microcredit and microfinance led to being awarded the Nobel Peace, uh, Nobel Peace Prize for the joint efforts to create economic and social development from below, demonstrating that even the poorest of the poor can work to bring about their own development. And here is a fun fact about you, Professor. When at high school, you ranked 16th of the 39,000 students in East Pakistan, impressive. So a huge welcome to you, Professor. We look forward to hearing from you and engaging in some lively discussion. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Thank you, uh, to Professor Beverly. That was really um, a short and sweet and wonderful. So. I'm your moderator today, Professor Yunus, and I'm extremely excited to have you here. And I have a few questions um, to ask you. So my first question is this, um, much of what you do and what you're advocating today is based on your book, A World of Three Zeros. Um, can you tell us more about this book and The World of Three Zeros? Well, I, thank you. Thank you for raising that question about my book on World of Three Zeros, because that's where I wanted to put uh, the basic problems that I saw for the whole world, uh, the mega problems. And I identified them as uh, global warming is one of the mega problems, uh, because uh, we are heading for a disaster because of the global warming. So I thought uh, we must address this before we do anything else, because this is a question of our own existence on this planet. Uh, the way we are going uh, soon will be uh, extinct. Uh, the human being becoming uh, most endangered species on this planet. Uh, that's the direction that we are going. So uh, I thought the urgency of this issue is missing completely. We talk about Paris Agreement, that's fine. We did a wonderful job in Paris Agreement. Uh, then we are having COP26 very soon at the end of the month, uh, in Glasgow uh, in uh, UK, uh, to review what we have been done. But still I see uh, the real sense of urgency is not coming up. So I wanted to put this on the stage to see everybody that look, it's a whole question of our own survival, whether we can, make it on this planet. An IPCC report just came out in a uh, month back, uh, identifies it very clearly. They give about uh, 20 years uh, to reach 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature. And 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature is the uh, kind of significant number that we should be focusing on. Because after that, uh, we enter the red zone meaning that no matter how much we try, it will be extremely difficult to recover our position, to live on this planet in a, in a comfortable way. So uh, the zone for discomfort and uh, non-existence uh, of the species will begin with the crossing the border at the 1.5 degrees Celsius. So before we go there, uh, we don't have much time left. That's a point that I was raising that uh, 20 years in a, in a global context is like a split second. It's a, when you talk about 
millions of years. Uh, 20 years is nothing. Uh, and, uh, and human existence here, uh, the thousands of years you human being on this planet. And here we are talking about 20 years now. And this is our lifetime. Most of us here uh, would say 20 years is not something uh, too far away. So we don't have much time. That's the urgency part that I wanted to focus on in this book, that uh, global warming. And I, uh, I mentioned uh, very clearly that the, our house is burning. And inside the house, we are having parties, <laughs> celebrations about yeah. our uh, glorious uh, uh, achievements on the technology sector, on the business, uh, economic growth, and all kinds of things. I said, the fact remains that we are uh, doing this inside a burning house. So yeah. our priorities are all uh, scrambled. Instead of focusing on the stopping the fire, uh, we are uh, busy celebrating and busy partying. So this yeah. is number one. Number two, the problem, the three zeros that we're talking about. Number two is the problem of uh, uh, wealth concentration. All the wealth of the world is concentrated in few hands. 99% of the wealth of the world is in the hand of only 1% people. So reverse of it, 99% of the people have to live with 1% of the uh, wealth of the world, which is absolutely unacceptable and uh, untenable. It, it doesn't work. It's a ticking time bomb. That's what I was focusing on. Third one, I was bringing the idea of uh, artificial intelligence, which we are celebrating. I said, this is a dangerous part. Is it dangerous because it will replace human beings in every aspect of our life. Uh, so human being will totally become garbage on this planet. It has no use for this uh, planet at all. That's not the direction we want to go. So what I'm saying, instead of having these as our uh, suicidal path, why don't you reverse our path, create new road to go to a reverse direction and create a new world? That's the world of three zeros. The three zeros mean zero net carbon emission or zero global, uh, global, emission, uh, global warming. That's the number one. Number two, zero wealth concentration. Wealth should be shared by everybody, not concentrated in the hands of only a handful of people. Uh, that's we have to reverse. And the third one is zero unemployment by unleashing the energy and the power of entrepreneurship, which is missing in, the, in our all thinking, all our economic uh, uh, reasoning. So we want to bring back uh, the power of entrepreneurship in all human beings. So these are the three zeros that we want to accomplish and create a completely new world. So we have to reverse the direction. And I focus by saying that if you go by the old roads, which you are doing now, we end up with the disastrous path of extinction. So we have to build new roads to go to the new destination. And the new destination is a world of three zeros. Thank you, uh, Professor. So you speak about you know um, zero carbon emissions, zero poverty, and zero unemployment. So I just want to build a little bit on zero poverty. You know, for those who are not familiar, Professor Yunus pioneered the Grameen Bank, which, sir, you won the Nobel Peace Prize for. Um, can you tell us a little more about microfinancing or microcredit and how a social business really works? Yeah. Well, uh, let me uh, focus on the microcredit part first uh, and, and then come to the social business. The issue that I've been raising, uh, that financial system is responsible for creating the problem uh, that we created right now. Uh, and that's where I mentioned the uh, wealth concentration. And wealth concentration is possible because of the uh, role the financial institutions play. Financial institutions are built on the principle, the more you have, the more you get. If you have less, you get nothing. So the people are left out. People who are at the bottom, uh, they are left out. Almost half the population of the entire world uh, is outside the scope of the financial system. They have an alternative financial system because people need finance, so you cannot skip that. So they, they live in a world of alternative finance, which is a loan sharking. Loan sharking means you get the money, but in exchange, you give up everything that you got. Uh, yeah. Very harsh uh, uh, terms that you are imposed with. Uh, uh, very unreasonable, very unkind uh, terms that you have to live with. So that's where all the resources, all the abilities of the people are uh, given away uh, in the service of the people who have the money. So the people at the top 
make all the money, people at the bottom lose all the money. So this is what is happening. Uh, so I was concentrating on that and saying, uh, re reasoning that uh, poverty is not created by poor people. So that's my starting point. Poverty is not created by poor people. Poverty is created by the system that we built. So system is responsible. So it's not something uh, self-generated phenomenon. The poverty is not a self-generated phenomenon. You don't go to the poor person and uh, uh, have a pity for the person because uh, she or he cannot use the uh, uh, talent that you have. Uh, they're too lazy, don't, uh, don't want to work. That's not how poverty is created. Poverty is uh, created by rejection. System rejects people. That's what the cause of the poverty. So in order to address poverty, you have to change the system. If you change the system, people will get out of poverty because they have created artificial barrier for people to get out of the poverty and be themselves and do the attention. So what we did, we opened the door for the financial services. The banker, bankers are always explaining to us, you, you, they cannot lend money to the poor people because they are not credit worthy. So I was trying to explain to them, why, why do you uh, argue like that? They are not credit worthy. Uh, should you blame people for not being eligible uh, or people should be blaming you not being people worthy, that you are not being doing the thing which people need. So that's the kind of debate that I got myself into. And I wanted to dis uh, demonstrate that poor people as good as anybody else. Uh, so far as banking is concerned. So I created a banking system to bring financial services to the poorest people. And uh, I did that, created the microcredit idea concept and created a bank called Grameen Bank to specialize in doing that. And people say, how do you do that? It works. Uh, and Malaysia is the, the second country after Bangladesh, uh, the Ammonite and Malaysia uh, yeah. to replicate what we did in Bangladesh. Yeah. We're very happy that Malaysia took such an interest in that. Uh, so this is how reversal came. I said, well, the one way I did this, uh, what we call now macro credit, is just reversing the conventional banking system. Conventional banks go to the rich, I want to go to the poor. So that's first reversal. Uh, second, conventional banks are used to serving the men, we wanted to focus on women and poor women. Uh, conventional banks go to the city, to their business, we wanted to go to the remote village, that's where we work. So we reverse everything. Conventional banks want collateral, we said, forget about collateral. We want to build a system based on trust because if you bring collateral into it, you bring lawyers, you bring everybody else, documents and so on. That's not how poor people can work. They're illiterate. Uh, they never had any expo exposure to all kinds of formalities and so on. So they get scared. And that's the end of the story. So forget about all those things. It's a handshake loan. You, you want it, we give it. And you promise to pay us back and you fulfill your promise. And people say, no, that's not how the real world works. I said, well, try it, try it. And we tried it and it worked. And today it's not only in Bangladesh, it's all over the world right now. It is even working in the United States. We have a gram in America there. We work in uh, 15 uh, major cities of the United States. We have 160,000 borrowers, all women, 100% women. And no, lawyers. Given over two, no lawyers. No lawyers, <laughs> no collateral, nothing. No lawyers at all, completely. Amazing. I said, the, Amazing. And, and the repayment rate in Bangladesh, in the United States and everywhere is near 100 percent, 99.5 percent and above. And despite all COVID and everything, they're functioning where all the banking system is in trouble. But the government system is working perfectly well. So this is how the macro credit thing came. And then as we did the macro credit, we came into the, uh, uh, looking at the other issues of uh, property, uh, poor health. If you are poor, you're poor in health. So we want to address the poor, uh, health because we work with the women. Women is a, is a uh, center for all diseases. Uh, there's no, uh, no uh, oh, yeah. services, health, health services for them. Yeah. So we wanted to create a service for them. We created healthcare system for the poor people, particularly focusing on poor and uh, women and children. Uh, so we created healthcare uh, insurance system all in a, in a financially uh, sustainable way. Uh, we brought many other issues. We were, uh, created toilets. Uh, we gave toilet loans so that you have a toilet. Every home, every Grameen family has a toilet. We gave them a loan. They pay it back over long years, uh, but uh, it gets paid. It's not something, it's a charity program. So every Grameen family has a toilet because of the system. 
and we created this system to bring solar energy in every home. So we created the solar energy company. We created many other companies. So we, we created these companies not to make money. That was the most important part of it. The, it was created to solve problems. Each one is a problem, so we create soft problems uh, without any intention of making personal money out of it. Uh, so we call it, we give it a name, call it social business. It's defined it by saying it's a non-dividend company to solve human problems. Uh, so we started that. People say, oh, how can you do that? Uh, you need uh, uh, profit is the incentive. If you take the personal profit out of it, it never worked. I said, you're absolutely wrong. Profit is maybe one of the incentives, but not the incentive. So I said, uh, people uh, want to be happy by doing whatever they're doing. Money may be happiness, uh, but making making money may be happiness, but making other people happy is a super happiness. Super happiness. So yes. I'm following the super happiness yes. uh, by making other people happy. So it's not a question of making money is the issue. It's how you make yourself happy. So I said, economic system went wrong. They concentrated on profit maximization only. So we became robots, departed from being human being. I said, human being, if you want to remain human being, you have to bring humanity in your picture. Economics yeah. doesn't have humanity in yeah. anything. So humanity is completely taken away from economics. I said, we want to bring humanity into it and define human being as someone who is driven by self-interest as well as driven by collective interest. Economics doesn't have any collective interest. So we borrowed the collective interest in economics. So this is the business to address the collective interest, which is a social business where you don't want to make money, you want to solve problem that brings happiness to you. And that as a human being, you can do both. You can make a business to make money. You can do business to solve problems uh, of the nature that uh, always remain unattended to, left to the uh, attention of the government. Individuals are not supposed to do that. I said, no, individuals are very much supposed to. Every business can solve human problems. So those are the issues that we brought in. Professor um, Yunus, you know, um, uh, I, I, I watched a lot of your interviews and I, you know, what you, you just said about conventional bank and Grameen Bank, and you moved from, you know, um, the uh, men to the women, from the um, urban to the rural. Um, can I can I also ask you why women? Um, you know, do you think that they uh, they they have special qualities to be entrepreneurs and um, unleash the entrepreneur spirit, the, like you just said? Yeah. Uh, well, this is the most popular question I face all the time. Why women? Uh, because it, it trickles everybody, it puzzles <laughs> everybody. Why women? <laughs> yeah. That's the last thing you want to do. So I, I kind of ask the reverse question. I said, did, did you ever ask why men? Why not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So why don't you ask the question, why men? Yeah, true. See, it's something wrong in our thinking process. When you do something for women, suddenly everybody says, why women? Yeah. But if you do for men, it's a normal, you see? So we use, uh, in our legal language, you always refer to he does this, he does that, he does that. We never say she does that, she does. She is completely eliminated. And uh, at the end, probably legal document will say he also implies she. Yeah. But why don't you use with the she and say she also implies he? What is the problem? So this is the mindset issue. Yeah. The way you have been born and you have been trained, yeah. you have start thinking and so on. So I wanted to focus on that and wanted to do the impossible thing. They said lending money to poor men is difficult. Imagine lending money to poor women because she has no capacity in her home to even handle little money in her hand. It's, it's atrocious to let a woman handle money. So I said, let's do that. And when we started Grameen Bank, the, our most uh, strong enemy was not the people who were opposing the idea and concept from outside, is the husband of the woman who is receiving the money. He became yeah. the ardent, yeah. Oppos, oppos, uh, opposition leader for the whole thing. Yeah. She, uh, he always opposed, why do you give it to him, her? Why did you give it to me? I said, what is your problem? I said, they, they always argue that she, she, she doesn't know anything about business. I said, that's our problem, not your problem. And uh, the, the husband will always argue that if she cannot pay back, you'll come and take it from me because I'm the head of the family, so you'll come to us. I said, we'll give you in writing under no circumstances. Will come to you 
to uh, pay for her. She's responsible. We are dealing with her. So don't interfere with her business. They said, no, she's not allowed to do that. I said, that's up to you. You figure it out within your family. That we will know. But if she agrees to do that, we'll be happy to give it to you. But we're not giving it to you. Yeah. That's for sure. So that we had to be very stubborn. We invited so many trouble because we wanted to give the money to women. Religious people became extremely uh, opposed to us because they say you're destroying our religion. Women are not supposed to be uh, handling money. They should be staying home. I said, that's you're practicing wrong religion because Islam doesn't say that. Islam yeah. has always encouraged women to be in business. Yeah. Even the prophet uh, himself married a businesswoman. So if you want to be a good Muslim, you should be looking for a businesswoman to marry because you have to follow the path that prophet has made. So uh, what are you arguing now? Thank you. Thank you, Professor. So, uh, the um, prophet has done that. Yeah. If you're not finding any businesswomen, come to us. We have plenty of businesswomen in our system. So you can find someone to marry with. Uh, so this is the kind of argument we had to come up with because uh, we are we are stepping into so many difficult uh, yeah. things, we, but we never stop because uh, we thought this, if we can win this battle, we can win everything else. Yeah. So we stayed on it, we continued it, and I'm very happy that it's been followed in other countries wherever Grameen Idea went. <laughs> and in the USA, I was mentioning 160,000 borrowers. Yes, All of them, 100% right. are women. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, you know, Professor, you also speak about unleashing this entrepreneurial spirit. And, um, you know, you have a huge uh, following of young people and, you know, who are future business leaders, they are policymakers, future policymakers, customers, consumers. And even this session today was a result of a young Monash alumni initiative. Um, you know, Arsh, Arsh Chaudhry Khan, who did yes. his internship with YY Ranches. And, uh, you know, he connected me to Mustafa Zulf, who, who's a senior manager okay. there. And we, in fact, discussed a potential collaboration between the Three Zero Club and Monash University, which brings me to my next question. Um, what is the Three Zero Club? How did it come about? And how can universities and students benefit and learn from this club? In the 30 book that uh, you mentioned, uh, that came out in 1997, uh, 1914. Uh, so we mentioned that uh, three mega power. One of the mega powers is the youth. I think youth is the power which will change the world. Yeah. So we should be focusing on the youth. Uh, and I tell the young people, look, uh, you are the power because uh, uh, not only you are power, uh, you are the um, power which uh, nobody else ever had. Uh, you are the most powerful generation in the entire human history. People said, are we smart than anybody else? I said, no, 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 that's not what I said. You said I said, you are powerful. I didn't say you are smartest. <laughs> you are as a, your previous generations were as smart as you are. But your generation, not only you are smart as a previous generation, you are blessed with enormous power of technology in your hand. No other generation in history has so much power in, in the hands of young people. Uh, even a teenager has enormous capacity to reach out to anybody and uh, bribe herself or himself up by saying, I have a million followers. I have a million, uh, uh, I'm a leader, uh, opinion leader, and so on. A teenager kid saying, I'm an opinion leader. Uh, and she is, or he is. And they're independent. It's, uh, and uh, suddenly you see your little girl is uh, leading a million people behind her. You had no idea that she has uh, she has so impact in so many people uh, because technology has given that power. I said to, I tell the young people first, make sure you understand you have the power, which no other generation ever had. That feeling that I have the power is in part in very important empowering power that the, I have the power. Once you feel that you have the power which nobody else had, then ask yourself the question, what am I going to, going to use this power for? Because that's very important. You have the power, but you must decide where you want to use this power for. Because you, you don't want to use this power for silly things. You can waste the power of a silly thing because you can change the whole world with that power. But what you did, you will start a game play and so on, state something mm -hmm. and fun thing and stop that. That's not it. So you have to design that 
idea what is the power I you uh, to use the for. I said, you have the Aladdin's lamp in your hand. If you don't realize this lamp is so powerful, you'll never touch it. And the genie will never come out of it. And you'll be wasted that power. I said, feel that you are the genie and you can do anything you want. That's what the technology has given you. I said, you want to change the world? You can change the world right away. Not your previous generation. They cannot do that, what you can do. And I said, you feel that and then decide what kind of world you want to build. That's why I bring the idea of why don't you think about creating a world of three zeros? And three zero means this, this, this. And people love that. So, but they don't know where to begin. So I said, why don't we create a three zero clubs? Five young people from the age of 12 to 35, just five, fixed five, no more, no less, five young people create a three zero club and follow that idea. What is this three zero that I'm trying to build? What does it mean? Is it true? Is it fake? Is it something reliable? Can I do something? I'm so small. I said, you're small, but you have the power. You can do it. And imagination is another power. You, if you don't imagine, it will never happen. So if you imagine the world of three zeros where there's no global warming, there is no wealth concentration, there is no unemployment, if you, it's an imagination. But if you imagine, it will happen. But if you don't imagine, it will never happen. So this is your chance. Imagine and take actions and make it. Even a symbolic action will do good. That is, after the symbolic action, then you can go to more. So all these three zero clubs, this is a micro clubs, five people club. So you get connected because technology helps you to get networking. So you can have millions of micro clubs putting together uh, the idea of three zeros. That world has to be a three zero club, a three zero world. Though there is no other way it can happen. If you create massive number of three zero clubs, only by doing that, you are coming very close to creating three zero uh, world that we are dreaming about. Professor Yunus, you also speak of, you know, um, I, I, I watched one of your presentations and you spoke about the two rules you have in a three zero club, which is no rejection and no abandonment. Can you say yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, so there's no reason why anybody should be rejected in that. It's a, it's a question of helping to understand, clarify things that they say, no, you're not qualified to do that. And some plead with us, sorry, I'm over 35, I'm only 36. I want to be in the club, can you make an exception? I said, of course you can make an exception, but not you don't become a three zero club member because you fixed it three, 35 years at the maximum or 12 years at the minimum. If you are 11, uh, you can wait. You're in the waiting membership list. So you can be in the, in the club, but waiting membership list. Uh, and uh, if you are uh, over 35, uh, you can be a support person for the three zero clubs. You'll be attached to a three zero club that you are a support person, you want to support the club and so on. Then you have a wider role. Not only you can be a support uh, person for one club, you can be a support person several clubs because you are over 35 and it will be 36, 37. You can continue to add other clubs into it. So I will encourage your Monash University to encourage young people and even the schools we are attached to, uh, connected to it, encourage the school children because they're the powerhouse again. That powerhouse begins in the high school and the junior high school. So bring them in, let them think what this is, what is, what is the direction, what is the imagination? Let them imagine. Don't restrict your imagination. Imagination doesn't need any money. Imagination doesn't need any kind of uh, uh, preparations. Just let your mind flow the way you want. What kind of world that you want to build, it will be a world of imagination that you have right now and make it happen. And once you imagine, it will, come very close to reality very soon. Thank you, sir. You know, I've already uh, getting messages on the chat box as to uh, how can I join this social, uh, this three zero club? I'm a Monash alumni. So yes, so uh, Mustafa You, Mustafis, you just, just go to the Google and ask yeah. Mustafa, he will explain yeah, to you. Yeah, he has you just given Google the for details. three zero club or yeah. also uh, get the number and do it and have an application form right away and fill it yes. up and you are a club right there. No complications at all. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. So you know, uh, uh, Prof, uh, Professor, we are already at uh, at twelve thirty. I'm very conscious of the time. Okay. But so I have one last question. Um, Go ahead. 
you know, you speak about maximizing happiness is not the same uh, thing as maximizing profit. And, um, you know, um, talking about this and talking about um, how you see the future of the world, um, what parting advice would you have for all of us here today and for all the young people listening to you today? Well, I would say something like this, uh, which I feel very strongly. And that's, I think, the very basis on which I work. Nothing is impossible for human beings. Nothing, nothing is impossible for human human life. All you need is to make up your mind. If you make up your mind, it will happen. So, so don't worry about the, how wild the imagination is, how wild your objective is. You always remember, nothing is impossible for human being. Once that human being makes up its mind. Going to the moon was impossible thing for all human beings, for years and years, for ages, going to the moon is a kind of wild dream. Today, it's nothing. It's, a, it's like a plaything. Soon, probably, they'll have a daily trip to the uh, moon, uh, go in the morning and come back in the evening and have a decent uh, lunch on the way, or something like that. This is such an easy thing. People are uh, going space tourism. I don't like that, but people are going space tourism. I don't yeah. like because I said there are plenty to do on this planet rather than True. you go in a uh, fun trip to go to the uh, space and so on, waste all your money, show off your money, yeah. uh, have a tourism, space tourism. I said there are more, your, priori your priorities are all screwed up. So you True. should be uh, taking care of that. So how to address the problem of the people who are trying to s struggle to survive. If the space has to be conquered, they has to be conquered in a systematic way, not for the fun thing like you are doing. Anyway, so I said this this is the direction of space, uh, sorry, science allows us to do that. So this is what uh, I would say that the young people, you have the most powerful generation in human history. Don't let it go waste. Use it. Make it, a, in your generation, make it a world, a completely different world than we are going through right now. And it's in your capacity. Believe in it. If you believe in it, it will happen. Professor Yunus, um, you know, before we end, I'm just going to take one question from the chat group, um, if you don't mind. And um, this uh, Miss Jayanti, she's asking, um, which of the three institutions um, have shown uh, a great success in microcredit? Is it the government, the NGO, or private entities? Oh, one thing I always uh, try to bring out, I said, government is uh, no good in running any financial institution mm -hmm. because government <laughs> represents politics. Yeah. Politics and finance get screwed up. Uh, it gets more in politics than in uh, finance. So it's, it's better to keep it away from the government because government being a political entity, uh, the finance is not the right thing. But government can support financial institutions, support uh, microcredit by creating, number one, by creating a law to create microfinance bank, a law for the microfinance, creating microfinance bank. That law doesn't exist. Uh, there, you can create a law under the, uh, you can create a bank under the existing banking law, which is the same all over the world. So you just follow and you create the, the, the same old banking, which we are saying that it's no good for people, is bad for people because it's creating wealth concentration and expediting wealth concentration. So we should be amending that, but government is not doing that. So you create a separate law to create microfinance bank. In that separate law, I insist that should be very clearly mentioned, the microfinance bank should be a social business microfinance bank. Meaning these banks are not for making money by lending money yeah. to the poor people, for yeah. individuals. It should be as a social business, it will be to help people to overcome their poverty and so on. That is the most important legal thing the government can do. And of course, private sector can do it, but quote unquote private sector. Private sector can be profit making private sector. That's what it is right now. So uh, that thing cannot do microfinance at all. They turn into loan sharks very soon because they want to make money. Yeah. Maximization of profit is not consistent with lending money to the poor people. Yeah. Because soon you want to extract money from the poor people to maximize profit. Yeah. Be even with the lending money for the, to the rich, you can billion dollars, you can lend million dollars, you make lots of money from them. You get tiny little money from the 
poor people. You say too expensive, your profit margin is too low. So you want to raise the interest rate, raise other charges and so on, so that you can get even and start extracting. So you soon become loan shark. And that's not what you mean. So if you want to be making money, you stay with the lending money to the rich. But if you want to reach out to the poor people and solve the problem of poverty and help people to become entrepreneurs at the bottom level, create social business microfinance bank. So that's what I would say in the private sector, there'll be two separate things. One is in profit making private sector and the social business private sector. That's a private sector too, but it's a social business private sector. So that's it. NGOs, again, NGOs, most of the NGOs are uh, in the habit of uh, becoming charity organizations. So ch sometimes charity conflicts with the financing. So you don't say, okay, support, they cannot pay back, so I'll give you more money and so on. So that's too relaxed. Uh, that doesn't yeah. go into financial sustainability. I insist on financial sustainability, but that makes you more powerful. You are not dependent on donor's wishes. And the moment donor comes into the picture, you lost your vision because it's a donor's vision which will be, you'll be translating uh, because he or she gives you the money. So you have to be independent and you make sure you're addressing the problem in a financial way, in a sustainable way. And then you take the unemployed young people, unemployed uh, uh, anybody to become entrepreneurs. You see, every case of microfinance is creating an independent entrepreneur that you forget. You always think, okay, poor people get some money. No, you are creating an entrepreneur. She yeah. takes the money, use the money to business and pays back with the income yeah. of the business. And you are an entrepreneur of the first grade, top, top grade entrepreneur. You started your business with $50 loan, $100 loan, and you gradually moved on to $500 loan and $5,000 loan. That's entrepreneurship. That's what the real thing. This will be based on social business. Then you become powerful. Professor Yunus, know, this has been such an inspiring afternoon. Um, Thank you. You know, and uh, we have come to the end of the session and, and I wish we could uh, spend more time with you, but, uh, you know, time doesn't permit it. I hope we get to meet um, you again soon. So thank you very much for spending this time with us. Um, and I, I, I do believe a lot of our students have been, uh, are very inspired now to join this 3-0 club. And I personally Please. look forward to a collaboration yes. with the UNOS yeah. Business Center and to see what we can That's do right. at Monash University. Absolutely. We'll be very happy if you could create a UNOS Social Business Center. Because, because we already have quite Malaysian. a few. Yeah, we already yeah, have quite, quite a, a few. Monash exactly. alumni with you. So um, exactly, thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. And I would just like to end with this simple statement you made, uh, which I think you also said just now that, you know, making money is happiness, but making other people happy is super happiness. I love that quote. Thank and uh, with you. that, I end this session. And thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you for inviting oh, hold on. me. Uh, hold on, sir. Uh, can we take a okay. picture? Can we take sure, a picture? Sure, sure. Let's do that. Of course, you can do that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, wait, let me remove the spotlight.